Hi, I'm Dr. Jennifer Schisler, Assistant Professor of Dermatology at Colorado State University. Thank you for joining us on Facebook Live. Well, today we'll talk about ears, and you might be wondering why a dermatologist is talking to you about ears. But actually, in veterinary medicine, the dermatologist is often the ear expert. And really that's because a lot of animals that have skin problems have allergies, and then they also have ear problems. But we treat a lot more than allergies. So what I wanted to talk to you all about is the anatomy of the ear, and I wanted to show you how we look in the ear and some things that we can see in the ear and how we diagnose ear problems in cats and dogs. And then we'll move on to some of your questions. So the ear canal in dogs and cats is in a little L shape here. So you can see it makes a turn. So this is why we can't just peek in the ear. We have to have a special scope and position the ear so we can see everything. And then at the end of the ear canal, we have the eardrum. And it's a very thin membrane, and we need that for good hearing. Then behind the eardrum, we have the middle and inner ears. And they have very important nerves in there, like nerves for balance and hearing and appropriate movement of muscles of the face. So this is why we have to be very mindful of all of the things we do to ears and what we put in ears. So I would certainly recommend if your dog or cat is having an ear issue, please consult with a veterinarian so that we can treat their ear safely without damaging any of those structures. So you might be wondering, well then how do we look in that ear with the curve in it? Well, we have otoscopes and the most commonly used kind is just a regular otoscope. And you might see this at your doctor's office and veterinarians use them too. And they're quite effective, they do a good job. Um, what we're very privileged to have here at CSU is a video otoscope and the video otoscope allows us to capture very high resolution images and videos, not only for educational purposes, but it helps us follow our patients and know what's going on. So we, very, we feel very privileged to have this type of equipment here. And you're going to see some images that we can generate from that equipment in just a moment. So the first video I wanted to show you is how we look in a dog's ear. It really takes a lot of experience to basically restrain that patient appropriately. But once you do that, you just need to look in there for a few moments, take some images with our otoscope, and we're good to go. So Maya is a black lab that we were looking at, and she's very wiggly, um, but we were able to very carefully look in her ear um, with just a little bit of minimal restraint. Okay, so what I'd like to show next is a picture of what we saw in Maya's ear. And so when we looked in her ear, we noticed that she had a little more wax than she should. Um, and so we can get some really nice images of that. And what would be good for us to do with that waxy ear is to take um, some samples under the microscope. But that ear looks pretty good. Well, there's some more interesting things than we can find in there. Um, the next example is a video of a cat um, and this kitty cat was found by my technician. She found this cat as a stray and he was scratching his ears and shaking his head. And so we used this scope uh, to look in that ear. And what we found was quite interesting, especially for those of you who like fascinating creepy crawlies. So in this video, you can kind of see at the bottom of the ear canal, these little white mites moving around and living their life. And Gosh, I can only imagine how that might feel for that cat and what it would sound like. But the good news is there's a lot of ways we can safely treat that um, and effectively treat that. So that's the good news. If we can, I'd like to move on to another video. Speaking of creepy crawlies, well, this is a little dog. He's pretty young. He's indoor, outdoor, and he was scratching at one of his ears. And so, we used this scope while he was awake to look in there and we found this whitish grayish round thing in there when we looked. And so we had him under deep sedation. We used forceps and we took this thing out. So he was perfectly still and it was a big old ear tick that sometimes we'll have in the Western United States. So that was very satisfying to remove. 
Um, and for that, he definitely needed to be under deep sedation because we don't want to hurt his eardrum. So that was pretty, <laughs> that was pretty fun. Um, the next image is more consistent with what we find on a regular basis. It's an image of an ear with allergy that's kind of red and has some wax in it. That's really common in dogs and cats. And sometimes when they have this, they're itchy on their skin too. Um, so a lot of these patients that have the ear allergy also have bacterial or fungal infections as well. So that's really common. That's most of what we do um, is that image. Now in Colorado, um, we have a lot of different grasses outside on the prairie. And so what we frequently see often in summer and fall around here are grass ons or grass seeds from a type of grass called cheat grass. And they have these little pokey seeds and they can sometimes work their way in the dog's ear and go all the way down and rest up right by the eardrum. And so it's really important that we take those out because if we don't take them out, they can actually migrate through the eardrum and that's not good. But that's a pretty common thing we see and we'll take it out similarly to how we took out that tick. Um, perhaps not quite as satisfying, but still, still pretty good. And then our very last image is of a polyp, which is a round um, fleshy mass that luckily for this dog is benign. And so we could actually cure this problem um, for this patient by removing that with our scope and our instruments. So that, that was great. So as you can see, there are many things that can go on in ears of dogs and cats. And they often show the same signs. So they can have itching and head shaking and material coming out of the ears and redness of the ears. Sometimes if it's really bad, they might be head tilting or dizzy or circling. And so those are some signs of worse infection. Obviously, if you see anything like that in your pet, they should see a veterinarian. But interestingly, all those things look pretty similar from the outside. So that's why we need to look in there. And as I mentioned before, the other thing we do to help figure out what's going on is to safely place a cotton tip applicator into the ear canal. And then we take that material and we look at it under the microscope so that we can see what's going on, if there's an infection secondary or not. So this first image is bacteria that we found in the ear under the microscope and all the little purple dots that's a bacteria that shouldn't be there. And so that helps us make decisions on what medication that we're going to put in the ear. The next picture is of yeast, also very common, sort of peanut shaped or um, footprint shaped. And again, this can happen secondary to any ear problem. And it, seeing that helps us decide which medication to pick. And the last one, my favorite, are little ear mites. And so if we're using this scope, then um, that's the way we're gonna find those ear mites. We're going to take a sample of that wax, look under the microscope, and they're just moving around like crazy in there. So that always gets a lot of attention with that. So I hope you have enjoyed the, these images so you can start to understand the things that veterinarians can offer to help your animals so we can make um, educated and safe choices of how to treat problems in your dog or cat's ear. So I'd like to move on to some questions that were submitted um, from the audience. So thanks again for submitting those questions and uh, trusting me with these answers. Just keeping in mind though, although I'm a veterinarian, I can't diagnose or prescribe anything um, from this um, type of venue, but I hope that you can take this information moving forward and have a discussion with your vet. Okay. So the first question is from Mary. So Mary asks, my dog, Sam, seems to be bothered at times with itchy ears. I don't see anything abnormal in his ears. Um, what, if anything, should I look for to know if his itchiness is abnormal? He's a Basset Hound Springer Spaniel mix, which makes me smile because that's gotta be a really cute dog, perhaps with giant, giant ears. So Sam's probably pretty cute. Um, well, I think a little bit of head you know, shaking and ear scratching is normal if it's very brief, intermittent, and infrequent. So, you know, once or twice a day, probably not an issue. 
when we start to become more frequent with that, when you see redness of the ear flap stuff coming out, for sure that's abnormal. But if you have any questions or concerns, of course your veterinarian can look. And that's something they could do at a general exam visit, or I would make a special visit if he's doing this a lot. Just so we don't miss something like a grass seed or some yeast down in there that we can fix for, for Sam. He certainly probably has a lot of real estate down in those ear canals or stuff can happen, so it would be good um, to find out. Okay, the next question was submitted by Carly, and she has a very detailed question, I think, that represents a lot of patients that we see in our service, so thank you for that question. So Carly has a black lab who's had atopic dermatitis. That's environmental allergy, usually of the skin. She got him at three and he's been constantly licking his paws and he's getting ear infections over and over and he's gotten treatments with um, prescription ointments that are good ones. She's also switched his food many, many times, but it seems like nothing's helped. Um, they recently did a cytopoint injection with, which lasted for about two months and she wants to know, are these injections worth it? And what else can she do? So this is, this is a great question. We see so many allergies in dogs and they get ear infections very frequently. So let's sort of unpack the different pieces. So um, your dog definitely has allergies from what you're describing, the foot licking, the ear issues, very consistent with that. And I know a lot of people in your position, they try different foods to see if their dog will get better. And it can be pretty confusing because if you go to the pet store, they'll recommend this or that or this. And to be honest, it's really hard, I think, to diagnose a food allergy with, pres with non-prescription um, foods. And that's because these foods often have common ingredients. So when we're trying to diagnose a food allergy as a cause of ear or skin issues, we want to really try to pick a diet that doesn't include anything they've had before. And then we know they need to be on it for at least two months and be very particular about everything that goes in their mouth. So that is actually the best test for food allergy, not any blood test or anything like that. That's the best test. Um, so the best way to do that test is to actually have a veterinarian look at the foods that, um, that your dog's been eating and treats and to pick a prescription diet trial food that doesn't include any of that. Um, and then we will have your pet on that food for at least two months. And we like prescription because those foods are made on equipment that only makes that food. Because remember, allergy happens when they only get exposed to a little bit of something. So we want it to be as strict as possible. And then we'll know for sure if they're food allergic or not. And that could be really important for you guys because if he's actually food allergic, you might be able to cut out all this other stuff moving forward. Um, so I would certainly encourage you to kind of uh, reopen that dialogue with a veterinarian um, or if you haven't talked about it already and kind of decide if you'd like to engage in that. Um, that also being said, um, you mentioned Cytopoint. So for the audience, Cytopoint is an injection for dogs and it's an injection that treats itch and dermatitis. Um, and it's actually works for many different kinds of allergies to treat those symptoms. And it's most appropriately used, in my opinion, if we're gonna use it long-term, it's a good idea to use it long-term in an environmental allergy patient. And if they're food allergic, then they can come off of it. So, so number one, um, as far as whether or not it's worth it, from a medical standpoint, um, if it's working well and, um, and it's giving your pet relief, that is great. From a medical standpoint, it is quite safe. Um, so we don't see a lot of side effects with it. We uh, published a study here about that. A lot of dogs respond to it and don't have any issues. So, so I like that as an option for treating symptoms. Um, the other piece though of that is the food is a piece we've got a piece here about um, treating the symptoms either short term or long term depending on if he's food allergic or not the third piece is just realizing that um, with the ear part of allergy sometimes the medications we use for allergy in general don't don't treat that as well 
Um, and that doesn't mean they're bad. I think it's just very hard to treat ear allergy, um, especially if it's severe without the use of topical medications. So for the time being, or acknowledging if your dog is environmental allergic, we may wanna consider talking to your vet about a maintenance therapy for your dog's ear. So you might go through a phase where you use it more often to get the infection under control and then use it on a maintenance basis to prevent the inflammation in the first place. So I think that a lot of what you're doing is good stuff and perhaps with some, some tweaks there, we could do even better. But whether or not that cyto point has value really um, is a decision between you and your vet in terms of the type of response you're getting. But from a medical point of view, I think it's a really good option. So perhaps a few adjustments and you'll be um, fewer bumps in the road, fewer flares there. So that's a, that was a really great question. And hopefully that was helpful for you all out there who um, have dogs or cats with allergy, uh, those pieces of information. So now we're gonna check and see if there's any additional questions um, at this time. So we're scrolling through that. But I also just wanna say thank you for turning to CSU for information and answers. Part of what we wanna do here is be a resource for everybody to make sure that we can give you good, accurate information about your pets. And I'm thinking at this time, we don't have any additional questions. Oh, here's one. Okay. All right, how do you clean a cat's ears? Always the hard hitting questions live. All right, so um, I could say very carefully, but that's not, that's, well, that's partially true. Um, it can be difficult because some cats really don't, don't appreciate that. Things that can help, um, most cats like their ears rubbed. So if you can get your medication um, pre-drawn up in a little syringe and you're rubbing their one ear and treating the other and then rubbing it, sometimes that helps. Um, it usually helps to have a buddy and, and involved in this. And really, I think, in general, um, I think cats are harder to medicate than dogs, some easier than others, but it comes right down to it that really, uh, really puts into focus the importance of using the right medications so we don't have to use it as long and figuring out why it happened so we don't have to use it as much. But simply put, when we medicate animals' ears, dogs or cats, what we do is we, uh, we place that medication, the applicator, just um, inside this opening and then if it's a flush sometimes we'll gently fill up the ear canal or a drop we'll put the prescribed number of drops and then we'll massage the ear and then um, and then if need be you'll do the second ear and then usually the animal runs away and shakes shakes their head and runs away so one thing I would say with allergic ears is they get a lot of infections and as I said if you can talk to your vet once the fire gets put out if they're a repeat offender you might um, do better by doing maintenance therapy once or twice a week so you don't have to do a lot of treatment intermittently. So that can help too. I hope that answered your question. I don't have some, some magic um, trick there, but I think definitely the syringe preloading to kind of gently put it in there quickly and being judicious about what we're putting in there might minimize how often you have to do it. So good luck. Um, perhaps counter conditioning for food cats. They know they get their food afterwards. I have a few that, that go for that. Any other questions we're gonna see? All right, well, it looks like, looks like that concludes the questions that we have. Again, I'm Dr. Jennifer Schisler, CSU Dermatology. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you found this both interesting and informative. And please open up that conversation with us or your vet if your animal's having ear problems. Thank you.